بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues uh, This is the uh, second part or the second talk of the infrahyoid neck and as you remember that we have divided the, the neck into two parts the suprahyoid part and the infrahyoid part and we have further divided the infrahyoid part into two subdivisions we uh, dealt we have dealt with the uh, first division and now we are talking about the second one which will uh, deal with imaging of the cervical lymph nodes as well as the thyroid and parathyroid pathology then you remember that uh, in the ct uh, scan of the neck we usually include the area uh, to be scanned and uh, we align the scanning plane uh, as much as we can parallel to the uh, laryngeal ventricle and we proceed from up down uh, every two uh, millimeter uh, scan intervals we uh, need to inject the contrast media in many times and the 2d reconstructed images in the sagittal and the coronal plane are uh, valuable for the diagnosis and sometimes we may uh, use the bone window if there is a suspicion of uh, bone pathology in the cervical spine or uh, cartilage pathology in the laryngeal cartilages. Considering the MR imaging, we use the dedicated surface coil and we uh, follow the protocol having a T1 and T2 weighted images and also we may have coronal and sagittal uh, planes. It's important to remember that uh, whenever we are going to inject contrast media, we need to have if had suppressed images before and after injection of contrast. Also, sometimes we, we may use the facility of MR angiography to show the flow within the vessels. This is the uh, anatomic divisions of the neck. And you remember the suprahyoid neck, we have dealt with the uh, anatomy and pathology of the tongue and mouth, mouth floor. Then we discussed the, the issue of salivary gland lesions and uh, the baropharyngeal space is discussed as a separate entity and infrahyoid neck we have discussed the, the uh, cystic lesions of the neck the vascular pathology and the, the laryngeal imaging in the first part of this infrahyoid neck and now we will deal with the neck lymphadenopathy as well as the thyroid and parathyroid pathology in child Considering the lymph nodes of the neck, we have many anatomic uh, uh, divisions uh, or groups, but uh, this is a reliable uh, uh, descriptive uh, way to assess the lymph nodes on, in the neck. We consider the submental group of lymph nodes as the group one, and uh, group two are the uh, lymph nodes located around the, the submandibular salivary glands. Then we have the upper and lower deep cervical lymph nodes or the internal jugular which are located deep to the sternomastoid muscle. The landmark between upper and lower uh, groups is the hyoid bone. Then we have the spinal accessory or the posterior uh, group of neck lymph nodes and finally we have the supraclavicular uh, nodes. You remember that in the past whenever the uh, CT was the only uh, imaging way and also the ultrasound to assess the neck lymphadenopathy we used to use the uh, size of 1.5 centimeter as a threshold for the pathologic nodes but uh, this was uh, greatly affected the, the sensitivity of uh, lymph node detection then the usual size or the usual threshold used nowadays is one centimeter for the size of the pathologic node. 
Also, they taught us that uh, the normal nodes are usually uh, uh, oval in shape or kidney shape, while the pathologic nodes may be uh, rounded or lobulated, for example. Then you see here uh, a group of lymph nodes in the submental area. This is the submandibular salivary gland on both sides. And you may see some of the nodes deep to the sternomastoid muscle at the level of the hyoid bone, meaning that they are in the upper group uh, lymph nodes. Then uh, we know that uh, the differential diagnosis of nodes lies between inflammatory and the neoplastic. And sometimes you may get lymph node hyperplasia, such as in Kesselman disease, for example. But uh, it's very important to have the uh, clinical findings of the patient and to help you for the differential diagnosis and to look carefully in the images, searching for a, a, a primary lesion which may lead to metast metastasis in the uh, uh, visualized groups of lymph nodes. In this case, and in the asterisk show the uh, an enhancing mass, and uh, the this mass is uh, uh, a neoplastic lesion affecting the lower lip, and uh, here you can see bilateral uh, necrotic nodes, uh, especially on the right side, they are large, and this is the usual appearance of. Uh, metastatic nodes they have a necrotic center and a peripheral enhancing uh, enhancing margin then uh, an oral cavity carcinoma like this one which affects the floor of the mouse on the left side and you can see an epsilateral node deep to the sternomastoid showing a necrotic center and a peripheral enhancement denoting lymph node metastasis but in this case of a child five years old she had a mass which is related to the angle of the mandible anterior to the submandibular salivary gland and the mass has a necrotic center and uh, what's very important here is to look to the stranding of the subcutaneous fat and this this in my opinion is considered one of the pathognomonic signs that you are dealing with an inflammatory uh, lesion especially whenever it is the subcutaneous in location like the parotid gland and the submandibular salivary gland as well. This is an inflammatory node, and you can you can confirm this by the clinical data, which uh, will show some signs of inflammation at this particular swelling. Then, uh, in Egypt, uh, there are uh, many cases of uh, TB affecting different parts of the body, and uh, this is the usual appearance of uh, tuberculous uh, lymph, lymph nodes in the neck. And the uh, nodes are uh, small, they are uh, adherent to each other, they have a caseating necrotic center and a peripherally enhancing margin. In the acute phase of TB lymphadenopathy, you may get homogeneous enhancement of the affected nodes. In the subacute phase, you, you got central areas of breakdown and uh, after healing or in the chronic phase, you got uh, nodal calcification. Then bilateral tuberculous lymphadenopathy, this is uh, an almost uh, pathognomonic appearance for uh, tuberculous lymph nodes in the neck as well as uh, anywhere like the mediastinum and mesentery, for example. Then uh, in this case, you see a lesion which is marginally enhanced with a central necrotic uh, uh, part and uh, this lesion is located at the anatomic site of a known lymph node group then you consider you should consider it is of lymph node origin and uh, uh, this was proved to be a biogenic lymphadenitis with an abscess formation in the upper deep cervical lymph node then uh, infectious mononucleosis is one also of the uh, uh, viral infections which lead to uh, enlargement of the lymph nodes and the nodes are usually of homogeneous CT density, they do not contain necrotic center. And in this particular appearance, they may simulate, simulate the sarcoid nodes or the other viral infection nodes and the Kesselman disease which uh, represents the nodal hyperplasia. In patients with AIDS or the, the, those who are immune uh, compromised, 
you may get cervical lymphadenopathy and also enlargement of the lymphoid tissue in the neck, particularly the adenoids. And you get also, uh, you remember in the parotid gland, multiple lymphoepithelial cysts, which are uh, wide spread, uh, uh, spread in the parotid glands in patients known to have HIV positive. Then um, the presence of cervical lymph nodes in an AIDS patient may uh, represent the uh, the reactive nodes and maybe re the, the sequelae or the an indication of uh, the presence of lymphoma. Uh, usually, we uh, used to look at decalcified nodes as if they are uh, post-inflammatory. But you should remember that some of the neoplastic nodes may contain calcium. The most common uh, uh, inflammatory lesions which, no, no, which uh, show nodal calcification are the TB and sarcoid. But uh, pneumoconiosis may, may uh, show calcified lymph nodes, the amyloid, the scleroderma, other glenilomas other than TB and sarcoid, and also the Kesselman disease. But uh, neoplastic nodes which may show calcium are those coming from the medullary thyroid carcinoma, which is known to give uh, metastatic uh, nodes containing calcium and the pulmonary metastasis containing calcium. Also, you know, the prostate in the colon, especially the mucinous adenocarcinoma of the colon, give uh, calcified metastasis. In cases of uh, lymphoma and the uh, metastatic nodes after treatment, uh, they may show uh, some calcification which may indicate a process of healing. Then our policy for uh, assessment of cervical lymph nodes is to look in the clinical findings and to look in the imaging. In the clinical findings, if there is a non-primary malignancy, then you should consider metastasis. If the patient is known to have lymphoma, then you consider lymphoma. If the patient is known to have sarcoid, then you consider sarcoidosis. But in the imaging, if you look in the uh, scans and you see uh, a primary, like nasopharyngeal cancer, laryngeal cancer, then you consider the nodes as deposits. If uh, you see bulky, uh, homogeneously enhanced nodes that are amalgamated, you think of lymphoma. If you see nodal calcification and you think of the, the inflammatory lesions, although you know that some of the malignant conditions may show nodal calcification. And if you see nodes with necrotic center, they consider the two possibilities, inflammatory nodes and metastatic nodes. Then, if you do not have any clinical evidence of these or any imaging findings of these, then you, you will say in your report that I, I am seeing cervical lymphadenopathy for biopsy. And uh, I think you all know that the best way for evaluation of lymph nodes in the neck is through the fine needle aspiration cytology guided by ultrasound. This is one of the best ways and the quick ways if you have a good pathologist uh, then you, you are able to sample any of the nodes in the, in the neck and uh, send it for cytology then you got the uh, immediate uh, diagnosis. And uh, this is just an example of a typical case of sarcoid where you see bilateral sim almost symmetrical enlargement of the hilar lymph nodes. And in the same case, you can see lymph nodes in the neck and these nodes are uh, homogeneous. They do not contain areas of, uh, of breakdown. Also, they are discrete and not amalgamated. And these are the descriptive terms of sarcoid lymphadenopathy. And here, the nodes are more bulky. They are uh, uh, also discrete, but they are bulky and they are homogeneously enhanced, no areas of calcium, calcification or breakdown, anything of lymphoma. Then, uh, and this patient with oral uh, carcinoma, and you see it, this is a metastatic node and this is another nodal metastasis, and this is the normal uh, submandibular salivary gland on both uh, sides. Uh, nodal deposits may have usually have necrotic center like this and this patient with a known oesophageal cancer and you see two necrotic lymph nodes in the uh, in the neck and this 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 feature as written here are uncommon for lymphomatous uh, lymphadenopathy and uh, this is a, a common appearance of 
uh, necrotic nodes that are affected by TB. And you see that uh, the smaller nodes are uh, homogeneously enhanced and uh, larger nodes may have a necrotic center and a peripherally enhancing margin. And uh, some of the nodes, whenever it's infec infected, it will form a, an abscess. And here you see a multilocular abscess in one of the lymph nodes in the uh, upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes. And you can appreciate the stranding of the related fat planes and the edematous changes in the wall of the pharynx as well. Then if you see lymph nodes without imaging criteria suggestive of a specific disease or clinical data leading to a specific diagnosis, then you would say that I am dealing with cervical lymphadenopathy, this is a submental group, submandibular group, upper deep cervical group, then uh, cervical lymphadenopathy for biopsy, and you know that uh, the best way is through ultrasound, fine needle aspiration cytology. Then we came to the uh, thyroid gland, and we will have some of the anatomic details then we uh, uh, mentioned th something about the uh, congenital uh, ectopic thyroid, then thyroiditis, and we have the biogenic thyroiditis, the Hashimoto and radial thyroiditis, then thyroid, thyroid cysts and goiter, thyroid cancer, lymphoma, and metastasis. Then you know that the uh, thyroid gland is conical in shape, but the apex is almost at the middle of the thyroid cartilage, and the base is almost at the, the fifth or the sixth tracheal rings. The measurements of the thyroid gland is five centimeter long, three centimeter width, and two centimeter thick. The blood supply for the superior part is uh, derived from the thyroid artery of the external carotid artery, and the inferior part uh, the inferior uh, thyroid artery uh, comes from the thyrocervical trunk uh, from the subclavian artery. Then uh, ectopic thyroid or a lingual thyroid is uh, the thyroid gland that is present in an abnormal uh, location along the course of the descent of the thyroid gland from the base of the tongue to its original side, side in the neck. This is the foramen cecum, and this is the course of the uh, uh, thyroglossal duct. And uh, along this duct, you may see cyst, which is a well-known cyst in the neck, known as the thyroglossal duct cyst. And you also see an arrest of the thyroid gland. In this particular example, at the level of the normal anatomic location of the thyroid gland, you don't see any thyroid tissue. But uh, in the base of the floor of the mouse, there is a big lump encroaching on the oral cavity, and this lump shows matrix calcification and is bright or hyperdense in the without contrast enhancement, denoting the uh, thyroid tissue, which is usually hyperdense in the pre-contrast scans. Then, these are two different examples for an ectopic thyroid gland or lingual thyroid at the base of the mouse floor encroaching on the oral cavity and this is the thyroid scan where you see uh, a, a, a uptake near the floor of the mouse without uptake in the lower part of the neck. This uh, lingual thyroid may be the only functioning thyroid tissue in about 70% of the, of the cases. The same lesions occurring in the thyroid gland can occur in the lingual thyroid especially this type of papillary carcinoma, which is the most common type of malignancy in the thyroid gland. And this is the appearance of a lingual thyroid and the CT scan of the same case showing the mass related to the mouse floor encroaching on the oral cavity. Then we came to the inflammatory lesions and the, uh, I should say here that most of the thyroid lesions give no uh, a specific imaging findings except for the goiter. But uh, we usually use the combination of the clinical data, the imaging finding, and the fine needle aspiration cytology guided by ultrasound to reach the final diagnosis in many of these cases. An acute infection, infection of the thyroid may be the sequelae of a staphylococcal infection or um, uh, hemolyticus or uh, other types of uh, bacteria, in including also 
uh, sometimes some types of fungi and the uh, uh, specific organisms like TB. In some cases, maybe the sequelae of trauma or uh, or uh, irradiation, and the, the imaging findings are usually non-specific. You remember, or you should remember, that the thyroid is normally very resistant to infection. And you know that iodine, which is one of the major disinfectants, uh, is uh, highly concentrated in the thyroid gland. Then the incidence of acute thyroiditis is about one per thousand. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, appearance will be more common, in, uh, especially in the children, due to some of the relation to the uh, biroform of fossa, I will mention it just now. Then uh, uh, this uh, acute subarytic thyroiditis may be common in patients with prior thyroid disease, like Hashimoto thyroiditis and even thyroid carcinoma. And uh, in, uh, in patients, uh, because this uh, gland is resistant to infection, E, e, the, the infection is usually seen in immune uh, compromised patients and uh, this is an appearance of enlargement of the right thyroid lobe with marginal enhancement and central area of uh, breakdown this is what we call biriform sinus fistula and th this was found a common cause of acute uh, thyroiditis in children there is a fistula track between the biroform sinus and the, the uh, thyroid uh, uh, thyroid uh, site, and uh, this fistula is almost uh, uh, seen on the left side. Then uh, you see a, a slight enlargement of the thyroid gland, which is relatively high dense, and you see a loculus within the infected thyroid. So, if you see a lesion like this in the thyroid gland, in absence of clinical data, you cannot say that this is acute separative thyroiditis. But uh, if you have some clinical data and you examine the patient and you find some signs of inflammation, then you may uh, suspect this and you put a needle to have an aspiration uh, uh, sample for analysis and then you will reach the diagnosis. As I have mentioned, many uh, of the thyroid lesions may be superimposed. In, the, in this particular example, you see acute subretive thyroiditis with radial thyroiditis and, uh, uh, and on top micro uh, carcinoma as well. But all you see in the imaging finding, and you see a, a lesion which is marginally enhancing with necrotic center and matrix calcification. Then you reach all these diagnoses by the fine needle aspiration cytology. This patient with fever and uh, systemic debilitation, and you see uh, an abscess-like lesion in the right thyroid lobe showing uh, central fluid hypodensity with uniform uh, thickened enhanced, uh, enhanced margin. <coughs> The, the second type of thyroiditis is Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease of unknown etiology. And uh, this is the incidence of the patient, of the, uh, the considering male and female incidence. The clinical findings include uh, thyroid enlargement, and this enlargement may be symmetric or asymmetric, may be lobulated or smooth, and um, uh, also the patient may have may gain weight and feel fatigue with uh, sometimes uh, uh, the patient is pale and with buffness of the face and joint and muscle pain uh, and the females are uh, find some difficulties to get pregnant and irregular uh, menstrual cycle all these are uh, yeah, supportive clinical uh, data but you are not able to reach the diagnosis without the cytology. In the ultrasound, you see diffuse enlargement of both thyroid lobes, and if you have the Doppler uh, images, you can see some vascularity within the uh, affected gland. And here we uh, know that uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis may show normal vascularity 
or low vascularity or even hypervascularity. This is not constant for the thyroid gland. But here, this is the pre-contrast skin and this is the post-contrast skin. You see diffuse, almost symmetrical enlargement of the thyroid lobes as well as the ethmus. They show almost homogeneous enhancement with lobulated appearance. And you cannot say that this is Hashimoto's thyroiditis unless you have the uh, pathology. And by ultrasound, there are uh, some of the reported features to help you to uh, suspect the possibility of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but they are all non-specific, such as diffusely enlarged uh, thyroid gland with heterogeneous echotecture, the presence of hypocoic micronodules like these uh, small nodular hypocoic lesions surrounded by bright uh, or echogenic uh, septations like these uh, echogenic lines then uh, as I have mentioned the Doppler may show the normal flow or decreased flow or maybe sometimes a hyper uh, vascularity with this kind of thyroiditis you may find some of the reactive cervical uh, lymph nodes that are present then this uh, lesion is one of the uh, risk factors for the papillary uh, thyroid carcinoma. Then we came to the riddle thyroiditis, which is an extremely rare or a very rare disease. This disease is more common in females and is characterized by extensive fibrosis of the thyroid tissue. And based on this finding, you will see that the affected thyroid gland is enlarged and it shows diffuse low signal in all pulse sequences by MRI. Diffuse in the T1 and the T2 weighted images because of the presence of fibrous tissue. But whenever you inject the contrast medium, it will show some enhancement. Then this gland affected by riddles thyroiditis is very firm and hard swelling in the anterior part of the neck and in the literature literature they say that it's difficult to differentiate between this riddle thyroiditis and the thyroid carcinoma or lymphoma this is the appearance by ct mri t1 t2 and t1 post contrast the thyroid gland is of low signal in the t1 and t2 weighted image with some faint homogeneous post contrast enhancement and these arrows points to a a small part of normal thyroid tissue that is not involved by fibrosis. It is seen here by the CT scan and the T1 and the T2 and after contrast enhancement. This is also an example of riddled thyroiditis. You, think, you see the thyroid gland is enlarged and you see matrix calcification by CT. You know that MRI is less sensitive for detection of calcium, but the evident hypo intensity of the lesion in the T1 and T2 weighted images is usually suggested. Then we came to the thyroid nodules and uh, we, we, we know that uh, most of the nodules are on the benign sector and uh, a small percentage in the on the malignant sector. The nodules may be hyperplastic or an adenomatous nodule or a cyst. Then we'll discuss first the thyroid cysts, which are common, and uh, in, uh, in many cases, they uh, uh, represent about 20% of the thyroid nodules, and they usually consider to be degeneration, the sequelae of degeneration in adenomatous nodules. Then uh, uh, whenever you have imaging, uh, ultrasound, CT, or MRI, and you can see a cyst, which is filled with fluid, related to the thyroid gland. Then uh, this system usually show hypodense fluid contents unless it, it bleeds. Then you got uh, a hemorrhage inside the cyst with increased density of the cyst contents. And in every case you should have uh, to aspirate this cyst by uh, ultrasound guided to ensure that uh, the cyst contains thyroid cells, meaning that it is of thyroid origin, and to exclude the presence of malignant cells. And then this is the appearance of hemorrhagic thyroid cyst. You see a big uh, cystic lesion of relative hyperdensity in the region of the right thyroid lobe, secondary to hemorrhage. And uh, if you see a cyst with a solid component, 
then you think of malignancy but here in the thyroid gland if the solid component is is more than 50 percent of the cystic is the cyst size then the risk of malignancy is about 20 percent but if the solid component is smaller than that then the risk of malignancy is about five percent and this is a benign thyroid cyst you see a cystic lesion in related to the right thyroid lobe with some internal septations and maybe a solid component but the aspiration cytology showed no evidence of malignant cells and this is also a big cyst in the right thyroid lobe and uh, you can see the closed sign which is similar to the closed sign of the renal cyst uh, that means that there is extension of the enhancing uh, thyroid tissue along the wall of the cyst denoting it is of thyroid origin and aspiration of this cyst uh, revealed brown fluid meaning that there is some hemorrhage uh, in this cyst but the cyst usually uh, re refill again and uh, this is the 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 sequel the sequelae of aspiration of uh, most of the benign cysts they usually recur after aspiration hydrated cyst can occur also in the thyroid gland it may show the classic features of of hydrated uh, like the presence of daughter cysts the presence of uh, floating shadows or the presence of mural calcification and this cyst uh, without any diagnostic features of hydatid was seen in a patient that has also other cysts in the liver in the kidney and in the lung and also in the anterior abdominal wall then the uh, uh, indirect hemagglutination test was positive for a kinococcal disease and uh, this is the follow-up after receiving treatment showing the decrease in the size with uh, 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 with a crum crumbled uh, uh, endocyst within the, the cyst itself. Then you know that uh, I have mentioned that the steroid nodules are on the benign sector in 95% of the cases and on the malignant sector in about 5% of the cases. Mm -hmm. And if you see a nodule like this in the thyroid loop, then you, you would say that this is, they may represent a cyst in the thyroid or an adenoma or focal thyroiditis or even carcinoma. Then you have to verify the nature of this nodule by having a fine needle aspiration cytology by, uh, guided by ultrasound. And in a single nodule, the incidence of malignancy is about 15%, while the incidence of malignancy in multiple nodules is less. It is in the range of 6%. And this is a nodule in the a right thyroid lobe showing a solid component and the cystic component and whenever it was biopsied the uh, the histopathology result was clusters of benign follicular cysts and no evidence of malignance and you remember uh, from the chest lectures that one of the uh, common superior mediastinal masses is the uh, goiter or retrosternal uh, extension of the thyroid goiter then you know that uh, we may consider this that the only lesion which displaces the trachea is of thyroid origin and uh, there is a lesion here and it's above the level of the aortic arch you cannot see the superior margin of the lesion denoting it is coming from the neck and th this is a retrosternal extension of the thyroid goiter Goiter is uh, a common pathology seen in about 3 to 5% of the population, commonly seen in females where it was uh, old, old, old age. And uh, the affected thyroid will show multiple variable sized uh, nodules. And these nodules are uh, maybe cystic and maybe solid, and they may show uh, internal hemorrhage, and frequently they also show some calcification. And uh, commonly, goiter may affect both thyroid lobes, but uh, it may affect uh, uh, one side more than the other side, and also uh, uh, may extend inside the thorax and may not. And this is a huge multinodular goiter affecting the isthmus, the left and the right thyroid lobes, but uh, the left lobe is uh, markedly enlarged, as you see here, with uh, nodules. Were collect 
containing uh, hypodense colloid and also foci of matrix calcification. A huge multinodular goiter affecting both thyroid lobes, markedly compressing the trachea, and this is the endotracheal tube. And this is an example of a huge multinodular goiter affecting the left lobe of the thyroid uh, gland more than the right lobe with areas of hypodensity as well as some of the calcium inside the affected uh, gland and you see the large intrathoracic retrosternal uh, extension then we came to the thyroid car cancer and we have uh, four types of thyroid carcinomas the papillary type which is the most common the follicular type which is less common the medullary type which is a little bit rare and the, the anaplastic type which is the rarest then we we should know that we do not have any specific imaging criteria for the diagnosis of thyroid cancer and we depend mainly on the aggressiveness of the lesion you may see a large lesion that is invading the adjacent structures or it may have metastatic lymph nodes in the neck or may show some distant metastasis like in the lung or anywhere and whenever you see a solid a solitary lesion in the thyroid then you think of uh, you have to exclude the possibility of malignancy because the malignancy in a solitary nodule is a little bit higher than in cases of multiple nodules the papillary carcinoma this is the uh, incidence is three times more common in females than males and this is the uh, age incidence in the third and fourth decades of life it has an excellent prognosis even in the presence of lymph node metastasis reaching about uh, 90 percent for 20 years survival rate and here you see that there is a mass in the right thyroid lobe with metastatic node in the lower deep cervical region and you should know that uh, metastatic nodes occur in about 50 percent of the cases and the prognosis is not affected by the nodal deposits also one of the manifestations of papillary carcinoma is to uh, metastasize to the lung and uh, we used to know that uh, miliary metastasis one of the uh, famous causes of miliary metastasis in the chest is the presence of uh, papillary carcinoma of the thyroid and this is uh, bilateral papillary carcinoma of the thyroid gland with miliary metastatic deposits in the lung bilaterally you know that the role of beta scan is uh, is not uh, um, uh, well established in the diagnosis of thyroid cancer it will show a, a strong uptake with increase in the standard uptake value denoting the presence of uh, malignant lesion but you all know that bet scan may show uh, increased uptake in inflammatory lesions as well so the final diagnosis will be reached through the biopsy which is commonly guided by ultrasound and this is an example of a biliary thyroid cancer by ct without contrast and the uh, bet scan showing uh, very much increased uptake inside the lesion. This is a case of MRI T1 weighted image and T2 weighted image showing a papillary thyroid carcinoma in a, in a thyroid cyst and you see the solid component is large. It was biopsied and proved to be a papillary uh, thyroid carcinoma. Then the, this patient in particular have a, a papillary thyroid carcinoma of the uh, uh, left thyroid lobe that has been removed then he developed a papillary carcinoma in the right lobe and follicular carcinoma is uh, one of the lesions that is more or less quiescent and you see a, a focal lesion in the thyroid gland it's common in the uh, females than in males usually seen in the fifth decade of life and uh, this follicular carcinoma usually do not have lymph node metastasis metastasis metastatic lymphadenopathy is uncommon and also hematogenous deposits are uncommon then you see a lesion that is well uh, uh, located in the right thyroid lobe and uh, you will reach the diagnosis of follicular carcinoma of course by biopsy 
the role of beta scan is, is to show if there are metastatic lesions for example in uh, thyroid uh, malignancies but if you see an increased uptake like this this will not support the possibility of uh, malignancy since you may see uh, this up uh, this uptake in inflammatory lesions as well then uh, uh, the medullary thyroid carcinoma is uh, the, the lesion which uh, produce calcium and uh, the calcium will be seen in the metastatic nodes as well as in the metastatic deposits like here in the liver. So we do not consider the calcified nodes as of inflammatory origin but we should remember that some of the calcified nodes may belong to malignancy. The last type, which is the less common type, 2% of the thyroid malignancies, is the anaplastic one, which is the most aggressive. And uh, this lesion uh, may show calcium, and uh, frequently it shows invasion of the surrounding structures and also lymph node metastasis. And you see here a huge mass on the left side that has infiltrated the larynx and the, the pharynx. And this is one of the attitudes of the anaplastic uh, thyroid carcinoma, a huge mass affecting the left thyroid lobe. And you see the marked shift and displacement of the trachea and pharynx. This is also another example by MRI T1 weighted image after contrast injection with fat suppression. You see a large tumor mass in the left thyroid lobe. Then uh, the medullary uh, thyroid carcinoma is a component of the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 1, type, type 2, as, sorry, type 2A and type 2B. In type 2A, you may see medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, pheochromocytoma and parathyroid adenoma. The medullary carcinoma is also uh, one constituent of men type 2B with mucosal neuromas and morphinoid facies. This uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome is an autosomal dominant disease usually see seen in younger patients and is bilateral in most of the cases. Then lymphoma is one of the lesions that can occur in the uh, thyroid gland. It represents about 5% of the thyroid malignancies and is usually a primary lymphoma. It may occur on top of Hashimoto thyroiditis as I have mentioned. Then the imaging findings are once more non-specific. You see mass affecting both thyroid lobes and uh, the affection may be symmetric or asymmetric. The enhancement may, is usually homogeneous with no areas of breakdown or calcification. Then if you use the PET scan, you will see severe uptake in the uh, malignant mass. One of the supportive features is uh, uh, the presence of bulky cervical lymph nodes in the neck together with the thyroid mass which supports the diagnosis of lymphoma. Then the presence of solitary or multiple masses in the thyroid gland and the presence of bulky extra glandular invasion and regional lymphadenopathy may be helpful but the final diagnosis is uh, through the biopsy, the needle biopsy. In, uh, in the previous days, and it may be still used up till now, which is the gallium scan. Gallium is uh, specifically taken by uh, lymphoma tissue, and it may help to discriminate between lymphoma and the carcinoma. But as you know, that it is much more easy to have a biopsy and to have a solid evidence of a histopathologic diagnosis than to uh, do the gallium scan or the beta scan, for example. Then uh, metastatic deposits may affect the thyroid gland and they represent about 2% of thyroid malignancies. And uh, of course, the imaging findings are not diagnostic, but you need the uh, clinical data of a known uh, uh, primary malignancy. And this is a case of renal cell carcinoma metastasizing to the thyroid gland with a large uh, mass invading the, surround, the surroundings as well as some of the uh, metastatic nodes as well. Then uh, this patient had a pancreatic adenocarcinoma with a large cystic or partly cystic metastatic deposit in the right thyroid lobe. 
this is the normal left steroid loop. In this case, the patient had the uh, gastric adenocarcinoma that uh, has a metastatic deposit in the right thyroid loop. Finally, we came to the uh, issue of the parathyroid glands. And you know we, uh, that there are normally two pairs of the parathyroid glands related to the posterior aspect of the thyroid. The upper parathyroid glands are located uh, posterior to the middle part of the thyroid gland. The lower parathyroid glands are usually located inferior to the lower thyroid ball or posterior to it. And uh, you, you may know that uh, up to 12 parathyroid glands may be present in a single subject. The normal measurements of the parathyroid gland are 6 by 4 by 2 millimeter and it weighs about 40 to 60 milligrams. Then the uh, parathyroid glands are considered endocrine glands and they produce the parathormone which controls the calcium metabolism. Then uh, uh, about 3 to 6 percent of the people may have less than 4 parathyroid glands and about 6 to 12 percent of, uh, of uh, cases may have more than 4 parathyroid glands. This is the common location of the parathyroids, but ectopic parathyroid glands can occur in about 15 to 20 percent of the cases in the region between the carotid bifurcation and to the anterior mediastine. Then, the clinical uh, presentation of patients with parathyroid adenoma uh, include, of course, the presence of hyperparathyroidism. And this may result in osteoporosis, multiple renal stones, constipation, peptic ulceration, and the remaining features of hyperparathyroidism. Then the imaging findings of parathyroid adenoma as seen by ultrasound. Then you see a single, it's usually single, but maybe multiple, a single lesion which is relatively hypoechoic compared to the echogenicity of the adjacent uh, thyroid tissue. These are the, uh, the, this is the diagram showing the possible ectopic sites of the parathyroid glands. And you see up to the carotid bifurcation and the in the superior mediastinum as well. Then uh, parathyroid adenoma may, may degenerate to form a parathyroid cyst, which is uh, not commonly seen in the clinical practice. The hyperparathyroidism, the incidence is about 1 to 2 per 1,000, and it is more common in females compared to males. The most common cause uh, to produce or to result in hyperparathyroidism is the parathyroid adenoma, and uh, also parathyroid hyperplasia, multiple adenomas in about 2% of the cases, and carcinoma, which is extremely rare in 1% of the cases. The parathyroid adenoma, its size is, is up to 1.5 cm in diameter. This is the commonly seen size, but the size may be larger than this and may reach a few, a few centimeters. Then um, in the previous days, we used not to look for the parathyroid adenoma, just we uh, diagnosed the patient to have hyperparathyroidism, then they explore his neck looking for the parathyroid adenoma. But nowadays, we may go for imaging, especially in these particular situations. Number one, in, ca in recurrent cases. Number two, uh, uh, to have unilateral surgical exploration instead of exploring the both sides of the neck. Detection of ectopic uh, adenoma before surgery and detection of other lesions. Then you know, 50% uh, of the le of the patient may have thyroid disease together with parathyroid disease, and of course to decrease the surgical time and the complication. This is the usual appearance of the parathyroid adenoma by ultrasound, and uh, the ultrasound is the initial way for imaging of the neck and to have sampling, uh, to have samples from neck pathologists. Then uh, uh, adenomas more than one centimeter can be confidently seen by ultrasound. 
but the smaller size of, is of course difficult to be detected. The usual appearance is uh, an oval shaped uh, structure that is relatively hypoechoic compared to the adjacent thyroid tissue and if you have uh, the Doppler scan you see peripheral hypervascularity around the adenome. And one of the commonly used techniques for detection of thyroid adenoma and to locate if it is ectopic or not is the nuclear medicine uh, by using the technetium 99M system EB for uh, uh, the thyroid and the parathyroid glands as well. Uh, scanning after uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes after injection of the tracer is usually directed to visualization of the thyroid gland but the delayed scan which is obtained between one and a half to three hours after injection of the isotope is directed for the parathyroid adenome then you will uh, you will see clearance of the isotope from the thyroid gland and persistence persistence of the isotope in the parathyroid adenome this is the system EB uh, scan and you see the thyroid glands and the delayed one showed the presence of uh, parathyroid adenome. Then this is one of the uh, important uh, issues to remember uh, that is a negative system EB scan does not exclude a parathyroid disease because if the adenoma is uh, small or if there is hyperplasia you may fail to uh, detect this adenome. And one of the uh, imaging uh, uh, the tools nowadays is what's known as 4D uh, computer tomography. And this is obtained by uh, scanning the neck before injection of contrast material. Then we inject the uh, contrast and have an arterial phase images. And then we obtain the washout uh, phase or what, what is known as delayed phase uh, scans. And this is an example in the pre-contrast uh, scans you may see some shadow which is uh, uh, posterior to the left thyroid lobe after injection of contrast in the arterial phase it shows intense enhancement and uh, in the delayed phase it shows wash out. This, uh, these findings are considered by the literature as pathognomonic for parathyroid adenoma in the presence of positive clinical data. Then uh, parathyroid adenoma, if it is relatively sizable in the range of one centimeter or more, it can be detected easily by MRI, it, especially in the T2-weighted image. And you see here a bright uh, lesion, which is located posterior to the left thyroid uh, lobe. In the uh, T1, the lesion is of intermediate signal, and in the T2, it will show a uh, high signal. But in cases of hemorrhage, you will see a uh, high signal in the T1 and also high signal in the T2-weighted image. And if uh, you inject the contrast, the, it will not result in an uh, 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 increase the detection rate of the parathyroid adenome. This is what we call the uh, technetium 99M system EB SPECT scan, which is the single photon emission uh, computed tomography. This was a, a way to have uh, anatomic details together with the isotope scan. Then you see an increased uptake here, which is located in the parathyroid adenoma along the inferior ball of the left uh, thyroid lobe. And this is an example of a patient with hyperparathyroidism and a sizable parathyroid adenoma, which is located in the mediastinum. And the CT scan of the same case showed the mass in the right paratracheal area. And the delayed system EB scan showed persistence of the isotope within the parathyroid adenoma. And this is the uh, scan system EB with a SPECT CT and see the increased uptake in the uh, ectopic parathyroid adenoma in the superior mediastinum. And if you see this appearance by CT and this is by uh, bed scan, and you, you, you cannot see significant uptake in this, uh, in this uh, lesion, which is related to the posterior aspect of the thyroid lobe. And this may represent a thyroid lesion and may represent a parathyroid lesion. Then you should go for a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and this was a parathyroid adenoma. 
In parathyroid cancer is extremely rare. The incidence is a half per million. And um, the presence of parathyroid cancer will markedly elevate the level of the serum calcium and also will markedly elevate the, the serum parathyroid hormone level. And the presence of these elevations may suspect that the lesion in the parathyroid gland may represent a carcinoma, and this will, will need to have a sample by ultrasound or uh, any way to have a, 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 a sample to confirm the diagnosis. Then uh, parathyroid carcinoma is extremely rare, and it has a, a good incidence of local tumor recurrence reaching about 30%, and distant metastasis in about 30% of the cases. This is treated by radical surgery followed by irradiation, and because of the high incidence of recurrence, there should be a long life follow-up of this uh, uh, particular tumor. The suggestive diagnostic criteria is a presence of a neck mass, which is the lesion and nodes or both, and uh, may result in vocal cord paralysis, the presence of marked hypercalcemia, and marked elevation of the uh, parathyroid hormone level. Th thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.